Well, good morning. It's so good to see you in God's house. And for those of you who are joining us via live stream, we're delighted that you're part of this special Sunday as well when we celebrate Connor Schulman's baptism and glorify our God. I'm Randy Harry, one of the pastors, so privileged to serve this wonderful congregation. And I'm delighted that you have carved out this time to worship with us. Many of you may be wondering, why is he wearing a mask today? Well, uh, we had uh, a wonderful experience two days ago, Kristen and I, as we went to Boone to celebrate uh, Ren's uh, graduation from App State. And uh, that's the good news. The bad news is um, this past week, after what we thought was a cold that just would not let go, she got tested and tested positive for COVID. Now, the good thing is she's 10 days past and she got permission to walk and we masked and kind of kept our sort of distance as much as we could from her on Friday. Uh, but out of an abundance of caution, both Kristen and I are going to keep our distance from you today. And that's why I was masking. We're also not going to greet you on the way out of the worship service just because I'm afraid we'd forget and suddenly hug somebody. So we, we want to be extra safe. I, I have no worries realistically that we are uh, exposed to it and worrying about it. But again, why take the chance, right? So that's, that's the reason for the mask this morning. Would you pray with me, please? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. And by the way, just to let you know, the, we and the Schulmans talked beforehand, so they were, they were cool with this as well. So just, I'm thinking everybody's going, well, they didn't tell the family about it. <laughs> so we just heard the scripture a moment ago, and the Gospel of John says it was winter. It was winter, and the Feast of Dedication was underway in Jerusalem. This is the festival we now know as Hanukkah the commemoration of the rededication of the temple after it was defiled by the Seleucid or Syrian king Antiochus IV Epiphany, Epiphanes. Rather. He was a bad guy, he really was, and he ruled ruthlessly over Israel in the second century BC. And he did two things that were absolutely horrible as in the eyes of the Jewish people and quite frankly in anybody's eyes. He profanely set up a statue of the Greek pagan god Zeus in the Holy of Holies in the temple. And he sacrificed a pig on the altar in the temple. Can you imagine how offensive that would be to the Jewish people? And they responded by revolting. And it sparked a revolt by Judas Maccabeus and his followers, and they overthrew the Seleucid rulers and ushered in a period of about 100 years of Judean independence. They had been under the, the rule of the, Seleucids, uh, of the uh, uh, Seleucids or Syrians before that. The rededication of the temple in December of 164 BC was a joyous event. And it's marked today by Jewish families with the annual Hanukkah celebration. That's why it's in December. Jesus, according to Ju John, was walking in the temple in Jerusalem during the time of this festival. He was in what was commonly referred to as Solomon's portico. It's a colonnade on the eastern side of the temple where rabbis often would meet with their followers. So it was therefore not surprising that the teacher Jesus would be there as well with his disciples. So the Jewish people were in the midst of the Feast of Dedication and they're remembering their century of national independence until the Roman conquest of, of Palestine by Pompeii in 63 BC. And here in the temple stands Jesus, who many were claiming to be the long-awaited Messiah, the promised deliverer of Israel, the one they're hoping is going to kick out the Romans who are now occupying them. And so there's more and more talk. They've heard about his miracles, his teachings, and, and, and so the, the word is spreading that this might actually be the long-awaited Messiah. The Jews, with their minds focused on the good old days when they were free of any outside rulers, were impatient to find out whether this Jesus was the real deal. And so they gathered around him and said, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Their words, however as you interpret it in the scriptures, don't sound like sincere searchers for the truth to me as much. They sound more like skeptics who have grown frustrated by obscure statements of Jesus, such as, I am the bread of life. I am the gate. 
I am the good shepherd. So they pressed Jesus just to come out and say it plainly, asking him, are you the Messiah? Or perhaps more likely, are you claiming to be the Messiah? For it doesn't seem that they were really believing that Jesus could be the Messiah. I think many of them were skeptical. Maybe they just wanted him to admit that he was not the Christ. Jesus responded to them by saying, I have told you and you do not believe. Now hear the exasperation in his voice. The works that I do in my Father's name testify to me, but you do not believe because you do not belong to my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. It was winter, all right. As John had noted, as many of the people were in a period of darkness and cold, not experiencing the new life that was there among them in the person of Jesus Christ. That was because they didn't believe that he was the Messiah, the anointed one of God. They didn't hear his voice as a sheep recognizes the voice of its shepherd, and so they didn't follow him. We're all familiar with the expression, seeing is believing. Well, Jesus was also saying, hearing is believing. If you hear his voice, his teachings, and they mean something to you, they penetrate your heart, then you will believe in him and follow him into eternal life. Just as sheep will listen to and respond to the voice of the shepherd, or a child will respond to the voice of its mother or father, so too do Christian sheep listen to the voice of the good shepherd and follow him. These two things will determine whether or not we belong to Jesus' flock of sheep. In fact, to the point I just made in relation to a child responding to the voice of its parent, I don't know whether or not you could see it, but during the baptism, Steve, when every time I would start, I would baptize in each name of the persons of the Holy Trinity, Steve would sort of do that funny thing that we parents do, blah, 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 you know, like making a funny noise to draw the attention of Connor to help him be calm as the water was going on, going on his forehead. And every time Steve spoke, Connor's eyes went straight to him. I was talking, his eyes went straight to Steve, demonstrating exactly what I'm talking about, about the familiar voice is the one that we go to. Well, in the same way, the sheep will do the same with regard to the shepherd, and only the shepherd's voice, ignoring the other voices around them. Here's a question to ponder. And it's one that, it's an interesting question for me to be asking. Why have you come here today? Or if you're live streaming, why are you live streaming this worship service? What has drawn you to a church on a Sunday morning or whenever you're watching this broadcast? When there are all sorts of other fun things that you might be doing at the same time. Now, I have to be careful about pressing that point too much because... You know, next Sunday, nobody's going to show up at church because they say, well, the preacher was giving us other options last Sunday. Bishop Will Willimon posed a similar question some years ago about why we come to church, perhaps. And he said the following, I think it's because you have heard Jesus' voice. You may not know everything about Jesus, may not know much about the Bible, much less about theology, but you do know Jesus in some way or another, maybe not as clearly as you might like, but clearly enough for you to follow him. He has revealed himself to you. He has spoken, and you have heard his voice as the very voice of God. Jesus said to those who pressed him in the temple for a definitive answer, the Father and I are one. And so when you hear Jesus' voice, you hear the voice of God speaking to you. That's maybe why you're joining in this worship service today. And it's certainly why Steve and Megan have brought their beloved Connor to this place to be baptized, because they understand the voice of God through Jesus to be present, and they have heard it. Now, the struggle we have is continuing to hear God's voice clearly over all the competing voices in the world. A new kind of plane was on its first flight. It was full of reporters covering the story. 
A little after takeoff, the captain's voice was heard over the speakers. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to be your pilot for this plane's historic flight, first flight. I can tell you the flight is going well. Nevertheless, I have to tell you about a minor inconvenience that has occurred. The passengers on the right side can, if they look outside the window, see the closest engine is slightly vibrating. That shouldn't worry you because the plane is equipped with four engines and we are flying along smoothly at an acceptable altitude. As long as you're looking out the right side, you might as well look at the other engine on that side. You'll notice that it is glowing, or more precisely, one should say burning. Now, that shouldn't worry you either, since the plane is designed to fly with just two engines if necessary, and we're maintaining an acceptable altitude and speed. As long as you're looking out the plane, those of you on the left side shouldn't worry if you look out your side of the plane and notice that one engine is, that's supposed to be there is missing. It fell off about 10 minutes ago. Let me tell you that we are amazed that the plane is doing so well without it. However, I will call your attention to something a little more serious. Along the center aisle, all the way down the plane, a crack has appeared. Some of you are, I suppose, able to look through the crack and may even notice the waves of the Atlantic Ocean below. In fact, those of you with very good eyesight may be able to notice a small lifeboat that was thrown from the plane. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you'll be happy to know that your captain is keeping an eye on the progress of the plane from the lifeboat below. <laughs> Isn't it true that when we find ourselves in difficult circumstances, the voices of those trying to lead us are often from persons quite removed from us, like the captain of that plane? And that's the problem with many of the voices we hear in the world today. They're not really with us or for us. They give good advice, but they're more for themselves. That's, not, that's one of the things that separates Jesus from all others. Jesus is not distant. Jesus is not remote. Christ is right here with us in the middle of any and all struggles we may experience. Jesus is with us speaking words of guidance and comfort and always love always love. The key is for us to hear his voice above the clatter of all the competing voices of the world and then to follow him. For the relationship between shepherd and sheep to be complete, the sheep must both hear the shepherd and follow where he leads. If the sheep doesn't hear or listen for the voice of the shepherd, the sheep is bound to wander aimlessly. And if the sheep hears the voice of the shepherd but then doesn't follow along behind him, well, it's still wandering aimlessly. Both actions must occur, hearing and following. You and I must listen to the good shepherd Jesus and then follow him. That's what Jesus is saying in today's gospel lesson. Those who fail to hear his voice are not of his flock. They don't know him as true disciples know him. His disciples, his sheep, recognize his voice and follow him through the gate of eternity. Hearing is believing. The voices of the world, however, will try to drown out the voice of the good shepherd. If we are of his flock, however, we are able to discern his voice above all others because we're listening for him. And that means our hearts and our minds are open to Jesus' voice. You know, there may even be times in our lives when we're not actively seeking Christ, and yet we hear his voice because our hearts are open to him. That's such an important thing, that we are open to receive and listen for God's voice through Christ. A poignant story in this regard comes from Diane Comp, who writes in A Window to Heaven When Children See Death in Life, See Life and Death, rather about Anne and her husband who were typical married baby boomers. This is back in the 90s. And well off financially, they had no time for church and they each became busy in their respective lives. Their romance faded early, but neither wanted to give up his or her lifestyle. Besides, both adored their children and their youngest son, TJ, was a special favorite of his mother. Even though their children were never sent to Sunday school and God was never mentioned in their home, one day TJ, out of the blue, said, Mama, I love you more than anything in the world except God, and I love him a little bit more. They'd never talked about God, and yet TJ said that. Anne was surprised, but told him it was okay. But why would he speak of God, she wondered. Two days later, on a bitterly cold day, while his sister was horseback riding, TJ crossed a snow-covered creek, fell through the ice, and died. 
Anne remembers saying, I hate you, God. But even then, she felt herself held in loving arms. Her world was shattered. She remembered the Christmas gift TJ had bought her that week. He had kept trying to give it to her before Christmas. And each time she had laughed and told him to put it away until Christmas Day. One day after he died, she hurried upstairs to open it. And inside was a beautiful necklace with a cross. A cross in a household that never spoke of God. Anne says that afterward, Jesus made her reach out to others rather than become lost in herself. Helping others helped me, she said. Anne's husband also changed, and together they became new creatures in Christ. Through her ordeal, Anne discovered a gift for spiritual hospitality, bringing healing to other parents. As of 1992, when her story was published, this young mother had reached out to help 200 families who had lost children in accidents. She calls her efforts TJ Ministries, not only after her TJ, but to emphasize how she's made it since then, through Jesus. In the midst of her deep, deep pain, Anne heard the voice of Jesus. She heard Jesus through her son TJ, and when she heard the shepherd's voice, she followed him. She followed him into a ministry which helped others, and in the process, helped her too. It's similar to what Emily Atkinson Ratliff, the daughter of Larry and Ann Atkinson, who grew up in this church, experienced following the death of her daughter Claire due to cancer. Many of you know her story. Emily spoke recently, a couple of months ago, to the United Methodist Women here. She and her husband found Claire's Army, a charitable organization that helps families of children in the hospital battling cancer. Because an army, so to speak, of family and friends helped them when Claire was in the hospital, the Ratliffs through Claire's Army are doing the same for many others so they can focus on better on caring for their precious children. I'd say they heard the voice of Jesus as well, and, and they're following him faithfully. Jesus is calling to you and to me today. The question is, do you hear his voice? And if you do, are you willing to follow where he leads? For he says that his sheep hear his voice and follow him. He also says that he gives his sheep eternal life, and they will never perish. We don't have to understand everything about Jesus. We don't have to have all the doubts go away. We can be confused and struggling and all of that. We just need to listen for his voice and then follow him. Praise be to God. In the name of the Good Shepherd, amen.